In the end, what was revealed um, was that the FBI had an enormous influence, uh, not so much in law enforcement, but in the most important parts of American life, education, war, and race, for instance. In education, uh, the use of, of informers' files uh, in uh, private hearings, the HUAC hearings, and uh, state hearings around the country in the 1950s and early 60s where people lost their jobs and had no access to the accusers or to the files in which they were uh, accused of being subversive um, had a very significant impact in education, particularly in the, in the social sciences where to some extent uh, changed the, the nature of, of research done. In war, the influence was enormous. Um, in the Vietnam War, from the day that the Gulf of Tonkin hearings began, probably even earlier, but certainly then because we have evidence, um, from the very beginning of the discussion of that resolution that was so important uh, to both Johnson and, <coughs> and Nixon in their decisions about the war, um, the FBI was there listening to see what was being said and would continue then listening and paying attention to protest um, to people until the day Hoover, until after the day Hoover died. But it was an obsession with Hoover continuously. And one of the striking things to, for me was to learn that when the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was being discussed on the floor of the Senate, that the, there were two senators who voted no, which we uh, people in that era knew very well, Ernest Gruning of Alaska and Wayne Morris of Oregon. And of course, as we know more about Hoover, it was not, uh, it's not unusual to realize that he considered them subversives for having voted against the res resolution. But what really surprised me was to learn that the FBI then somehow collected, the got access to the letters and telegrams of everybody who wrote to those two senators expressing support for the stance that they had taken uh, in, with their vote on that resolution. And then those people acquired FBI files and that went on for years. Raising a question or stating that kind of approval was not acceptable. And then when it comes to race, I think that the results have been profound and probably in ways that we haven't begun to know or deal with as far as the impact is concerned. You know, it began at the highest level with Hoover uh, expressing to, to presidents uh, concern if they had any uh, positive inclination toward the civil rights movement. I think it had a strong impact on, on Eisenhower, for, for, for instance. He would say, don't, don't get involved in that because it's all motivated by communists, which was enough to make people stand back. Um, setting group against group within the black community uh, to f foment violence, intra-organizational violence, for instance, with the Panthers, but also across organizations. The instigation of violence uh, among black groups and within black groups that was caused by informers, we now can know in retrospect, was so great that it's impossible to look back on that era at, at any uh, incidents of, of significant violence uh, in the black community and have any certainty about whether it was genuine conflict or whether it was conflict that was manufactured um, by Hoover's uh, informers in order to accomplish what the perp one of the purposes of the COINTELPRO operations, which was to neutralize and destroy groups. Now, just briefly in, in closing, my role. Uh, I come into this story twice. <laughs> I was a reporter at the Washington Post and received the files two weeks after the burglary. And um, one thing you might be interested in knowing about that is that it was a difficult decision for the Post. It wasn't a difficult decision for me. I was <laughs> a young reporter. I read those files and I thought this is very important. I'm, let's write this story. Um, and at the top of echelons, it was a, it was a different matter. Um, editors ex had strong support for it and did support it. But what I didn't know as I wrote that afternoon 
uh, was that Catherine Graham opposed writing about it, and so did the chief legal counsel for, for the Post. Uh, I didn't realize that until 6 o'clock that afternoon when I emerged with my story and was told that it might not run. And the decision to run was made by, by 10 o'clock that night. And um, the editors had supported it all along. Now, I should point out that there, the reasons for that may be obvious. Um, for one thing, this was unprecedented. We were still three months from the Pentagon Papers. And when I received those stolen files, it was the first time that a journalist had, had received secret government files from a source outside government who had stolen them. So that caused some pause in the publisher's office. It also was the first time that Catherine Graham was demanded by the Nixon administration to suppress a story because they didn't like it. Those two factors were pretty strong uh, things to have on her plate uh, and have to make a decision about in a fairly short period of time. It was, I like to think it was the beginning of her having to deal with this, and then that was practice for what came just a few months later and the next year later. I should also point out that the Attorney General, John Mitchell, uh, the entire afternoon was calling each of the two principal editors, Ben Bradley and, and Ben Bagdickian, and then Catherine. Uh, they called each of them at least twice that afternoon. Uh, telling them that this story must not run and telling them that uh, it would in, endanger lives and endanger national security. Uh, two things that you take very seriously. And it was very evident from reading the files that that was not the case. Um, so um, years later, many years later, um, I had a trip from... I was living in California by that time. And I had a trip to Missouri and a trip to Massachusetts and in between a long weekend. And I decided that I would give myself the gift of a long weekend in Philadelphia where I had worked before I came to the Washington Post at the beginning of 1970. And so I just filled that weekend with uh, personal appointments with former colleagues and friends, people I had known in Philadelphia. And the first evening, uh, I had made a, I had called a couple and asked them if I could uh, see them. And we hadn't seen each other for about 10 years. We were acquaintances, not close friends, but we liked each other. And we're happy at that prospect of seeing each other. And they said, come to dinner. And so I went to dinner, and we had many things to talk about that had happened in our lives in the past 10 years. And we went to the uh, dining room to, to, to eat, and in the course of the dinner, um, their youngest child, the fourth child in their family, uh, came into the dining room, and uh, the father said, Mary, we want you to know, Betty, because many years ago, when your dad and mother had information about the FBI that we wanted to give to the American people, we gave it to Betty. And I was shocked. It was clear that it meant nothing to the little girl. <laughs> and I could hardly wait until she left the room. And so I, as soon as she did, I said, are you telling me that you're the media burglars? And uh, they said, yes. <laughs> and I was truly amazed. I never had any idea who the burglars were. I had never given it much thought. I just assumed that because of that very large peace movement in Philadelphia and that the return address was media, and that it had happened so close to Philadelphia that it probably was people in the Philadelphia peace movement. Um, and indeed, <laughs> they were two people whom, whom I knew. And that was the beginning of my then uh, thinking of little else <laughs> for a few weeks, and, uh, and then finally saying, uh, I would, they had told me that night that the eight of them had all promised each other that they would take the secret of the burglary, assuming they were not arrested, they would take the secret of the burglary to their graves. And so I got in touch with them a few weeks later and said, I would very much like to write a book about this. I think it's a very important piece of history that should be known. And I hope you'll 
reconsider that promise that you made to each other and help me found, find the other burglars. <laughs>